Hi, welcome to State Department Live, the State Department's new web chat platform that lets us interact with our audiences from all over the world. I'd like to welcome you today. Today we'll be talking about U.S. engagement with Libya, and we will be speaking with our U.S. Ambassador to Libya, Jean Kretz. I'd like to welcome you to, to you. our program today. Just as a quick reminder, I would like to, remem to remind you that if you have questions, you can actually start typing them in now in the lower left-hand side of your screen that says questions for Ambassador Kretz. Please make sure that you identify yourself by your name and your news organization so that we can know who we're speaking with at all times. Um, we have about 30 minutes today and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the 30 minutes we have. With that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Ambassador Kratz. Thank you. Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm very pleased to, to be here today. Uh, I'll just open up by a few comments saying what an incredibly, uh, incredible historic moment we have witnessed uh, over the past six months. A courageous Libyan people rising up against a tyrant who had basically suffocated them for almost 42 years and uh, taking up arms for the, for the first time against him uh, in, a, in a quest uh, for uh, human rights and dignity and democracy. Uh, we, we know that the, uh, the past six months have been extremely difficult. Uh, it's not over yet. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi remains on the run along with two of his most dangerous sons. Uh, but the, uh, the Libyan people, uh, along with the leadership uh, of the TNC, uh, with Mr. Ad, uh, Mustafa Al-Jalil and Mahmoud Jibril, have made extraordinary strides uh, in bringing this uh, revolution to where it is. And I think that all of us uh, who have been able to support the Libyans in their quest are extremely proud and at once also admire the courage that they have uh, shown uh, during these past six months. Thank you. With that, we'll start with our first question. Good afternoon, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Walter Menya, a reporter with Nation Media, Nairobi, Kenya. My question is whether the U.S. agrees with the African Union position that a political rather than a military solution should be found to deal with the Libya crisis. And secondly, what is your reaction to the level of AU's engagement in the Libya crisis? And lastly, do you believe the world would be safer without Gaddafi? Well, I think that those are very good questions. Uh, look, we, we've had uh, a lot of uh, interaction uh, with the AU over the past several months, and certainly we've encouraged the TNC <coughs> to improve their uh, relationship uh, with the AU. I think along the way there have been some misunderstandings on both sides. And uh, as you know, uh, several weeks ago, Mr. Uh, Mahmoud Jibril visited uh, the uh, headquarters of the AU in Addis Ababa, and I think they had a good uh, uh, discussion in which they clarified a lot of their, their views. And I think on the, on the TNC side, Mr. Jabril clarified that uh, uh, you know, Libya, a new Libya would, n would in no way um, turn its back on Africa. Libya was an African nation and it looked forward to good relations uh, with uh, Africa. Uh, for its part, uh, you know, the AU uh, had a roadmap. Uh, they had a, uh, for some of the countries had a different approach, believing perhaps that a you know, that they, uh, the political solution uh, was the best way to go and that, which, that should be the focus of our efforts. There were efforts, uh, you know, to, to try to bring a political solution to this, uh, but unfortunately they, uh, they didn't come to fruition and this is why it, it ended in the way it did uh, as we see right now. Our next question comes from Mark Klusener from ETV South Africa. Is the U.S. worried about reports that weapons used in the Libyan conflict have left the country and might fall into the hands of military groups? Well, I think in general, you know, the, the fact, uh, number one, that there was such a, 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 a profusion or proliferation of arms during the conflict is worrying uh, for all of us. Uh, you know that uh, Gaddafi and his regime also opened up their stores uh, to allow a population that had not been armed before to become armed. So, of course, uh, this is an issue. Uh, we're working with the uh, TNC. They are very aware, I think, of the potential problems uh, that this proliferation of arms uh, has brought. And I think that they will be very uh, judicious in trying to devise a program uh, to make sure that we can de decommission and uh, collect these uh, weapons as time goes on. Uh, we also hope that uh, Libya and the international community, along with the uh, uh, African uh, nations will be able to work together uh, in this next period to make sure that uh, no groups, for example, like Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb 
or that other uh, groups uh, that may want to threaten the uh, stability of other African nations uh, are allowed to uh, gain any uh, support or gain any uh, benefit uh, from this profusion uh, of arms. But it is something that is worrying and it is an issue that the international community, all of us have to work together on to stem very quickly. Great. Can you tell us when the U.S. will reopen its embassy in Tripoli? Uh, right now, well, I think you know, uh, if you followed the, the news, certainly our embassy was uh, uh, along with that of the uh, British, uh, French, and Italians was trashed uh, the evening, I believe, of uh, April 30th uh, by Gaddafi's goons when he discovered that his, uh, his son had been killed in one of the attacks. Uh, we don't know exactly right now what the, uh, the complete status of our embassy is. We're, we've sent a small team in to try to do an assessment. Uh, as soon as we get uh, a, an assessment from that team back, we will then take the appropriate steps to reinstate our diplomatic presence, which I believe uh, will be done in a very, very uh, quick time. In your view, how has the TNC acted so far? I think from the start, um, you know, th there were questions uh, on the part of the international community and certainly on the part of the United States and its allies, uh, uh, you know, with respect to who were the, the, the TNC, this group that arose from what really was a, a grassroots rebellion. Um, and we, uh, you know, I went out early on during the uh, crisis at the request of the Secretary of State to meet these people, some of whom I knew from the previous uh, <coughs> regime when I was ambassador and had dealings with them. And uh, my initial sense was that they were a, a well-meaning group. They were composed of doctors, lawyers, accountants, engineers, people really who hadn't had a, a real feel for politics because under the rule of Gaddafi, uh, there hadn't been one milliliter of oxygen to breathe any fresh air uh, of politics or, or civil society. I think as time went on uh, and we saw statements from the TNC with respect to how they, how they envisioned uh, a new democratic Libya, how they wanted this to be one Libya, how they were going to deal with the question of human rights, how they were going to deal with international obligations, I think the international community uh, became very, very comfortable and we saw that in the various uh, contact group meetings that took place uh, in Doha, in the uh, UAE, uh, in Rome, and in Istanbul, and finally in Paris last week. So I think that the TNC has done very well. They've made some mistakes along the way, there's no doubt. Uh, but look what they started with. And I, I've been, in my comments to audiences, I've said, let's, let's look at the achievements that they have made, uh, given uh, what they were uh, bestowed by a, uh, by a Gaddafi regime that had basically ruled the country uh, with a policy of divide and conquer. So uh, the TNC uh, has made great strides. Uh, they've made mistakes, but they also, uh, I think, have done the right thing by and large, both in word and deed. Our next question comes from Arnut Alayam, Palestine. Were you surprised with the way Gaddafi responded to his people? And when do you expect him to leave? You know, anybody who's followed uh, the Gaddafi and the history of 42 years of uh, repression and suppression in our country uh, wouldn't be surprised at anything that uh, Gaddafi did. I think we were particularly shocked with the, uh, with the level of violence to, to immediately, in the first days of a, of a conflict, uh, I mean, of, of people asking only for basic human rights, that this regime would turn on its people with such ferocity and such violence, I think it, uh, it, it, it impacted all of us. And, um, you know, words count. And I think that that was always the message that was given to us when we were in Libya as diplomats, that we needed to be careful with the words uh, that we said, because whenever they were uh, uh, of a kind that uh, offended or potentially offended the regime, we were told uh, to be careful. Well, when Gaddafi said that he was going to uh, go to Benghazi and clean out these... Uh, quote-unquote, rats that he called his own people, we took it very seriously. And it was on that basis, on the humanitarian basis, on the potential of a humanitarian catastrophe that uh, President Obama and the rest of the coalition acted. So were we surprised? No, I don't think we were surprised. Next question comes from Khaldun Al-Hayat Al-Jadida Al newspaper from Palestine. Um, what is the U.S. vision for the new Libya? And if democratic processes bring Islamists, Islamists to rule, how do you describe the U.S. position then? Well, I think that it's, it's very clear that uh, from the start, the vision uh, of a new Libya 
uh, has been uh, a democratic one. Well, I don't know, we don't know right uh, yet what that democratic process will look like at the end of the day. Uh, but what we do know is that in the first few weeks of the flush of freedom in Benghazi and the areas under uh, the uh, TNC uh, and opposition rule uh, when, they were, when they broke free from Gaddafi in those first few weeks and months, we saw people coming out into the streets uh, you know, uh, calling for democracy. We saw them debating in the streets, the meeting of a constitution. Uh, we saw them uh, helping each other. We saw them developing a civil society of uh, non-governmental organizations. So uh, I, I think that uh, the Libyan people pretty much know uh, the kind of uh, democracy uh, uh, that they want to create. And it will be a, a Libyan democracy, but we'll have to wait and see what it is. We will help them in whatever way they want, but it has to be a Libyan-led and a Libyan-devised process. Uh, with respect to Islamists, uh, I, uh, I think the Libyans uh, acknowledge that there, are, uh, there is an Islamic element within the body politic that, uh, that, may, that could play a role as long as it's a, a moderate one. Uh, and I think that it's been made very clear by the leadership and by the people of Libya that they have no intention of uh, swapping after six months of blood and, uh, and violence, of swapping one dictatorship of a, of a tyrant for another dictatorship of uh, any ideology that would tend to uh, keep them down again and not give them the, the human rights and uh, the kind of allow them to develop the kind of uh, democratic institutions that they fought so hard for and died so hard for. Our next question comes from Mina al Raibi from al Shak al Shak al Do you seek to reopen the Megrahi case? Uh, we have said uh, in public, and certainly the, the secretary in her discussions with the uh, leadership of TNC has said that the Megrahi case uh, remains a uh, very sensitive one for the United States and that we will, uh, we will continue to raise it uh, uh, as appropriate. The uh, leadership of TNC, I think, recognizes that this is a sensitive case and uh, uh, they understand the sensitivity of this case uh, for the United States and certainly for the, uh, for the UK as well. Our next question comes from Sarah Carter from CBS News. Could Libya descend into tribal warfare after the war against Gaddafi? And how concerned are you about this scenario? When you look at the kind of uh, nation, quote unquote, that Gaddafi left to the uh, opposition, it's one that, as I said before, was built on a, uh, a, a philosophy of divide and conquer. Uh, there are divisions between North and South. There are divisions between East and West. There are intertribal uh, problems. There are problems with uh, how minorities were treated. Uh, so, uh, you know, they've, in, they've inherited a shattered nation. Uh, are we concerned? Certainly. Uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is not just a, a, a task for the new, leadership, the new Libyan leadership to uh, uh, recreate a nation. In fact, what they have to do is to create a nation. So uh, the tribal rivalries certainly are, are, are important and they have to be dealt with. Uh, but I think that the TNC has shown a lot of wisdom in, first of all, acknowledging the various problems that face Libya. And secondly, in terms of the kinds of plans that they have uh, to hope, hopefully uh, reconcile uh, these various, uh, the body politic that has been torn asunder by the uh, Gaddafi regime for 42 years. They know the challenge ahead of them. Uh, but they, uh, I think they're up to it at this point. We have a follow-up from Mina. She would like to know, um, what would you like to see happen to Gaddafi, and do you seek extradition or just house arrest, which it appears he is under? Look, the final, the, the final uh, decision about whatever happens to Gaddafi and uh, his sons and any, any other members of the regime that are found uh, to have blood on their hands is, is an issue for the Libyan uh, people to decide, the Libyan leadership. Uh, we have uh, obviously made our point clear uh, that the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, ICC warrant uh, those nations uh, should, uh, who, who have him in their, uh, you know, who are able to control him, uh, should turn him over to the ICC. But as I said, this is, an, uh, this is a question for the Libyan people and the Libyan government to decide. I have a quick correction, follow up on Megrahi. Yeah. <laughs> what would you like to see happen to him? And do you, do you seek extradition or just house arrest? This is a question for our you know, Department of Justice. We'll be dealing with these, uh, with these issues uh, uh, as, as time goes on. Right now, I think we're, we've made our point clear about Megrahi. 
uh, and um, we've made our you know our, our position clear also to the uh, to the TNC leadership and uh, we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out over the next few days and weeks. Next question comes from Brooke Tignier from EU NATO Affairs Correspondents from Defense Weekly. NATO says it will take no boots on the ground role in an immediate post-conflict Libya, nor does it seek any defense sector reform role in the country right away either. However, Libya will need a newly trained and professional army soon. Does Washington have any intention to do this instead? Uh, this is an issue, you know, that, that uh, each country, uh, whether it's NATO or whether it's uh, each individual country, um, will have discussions with the Libyan leadership as time goes on. Uh, certainly, uh, the new leadership uh, will want to uh, be able to uh, defend its borders. And I think that uh, as, uh, as the situation uh, clears up and as it develops, uh, we, we, among others, will have that kind of discussion with the Libyan leadership to make sure that the, uh, the, Libyan, the new Libyan nation uh, is afforded the kind of military uh, for defensive needs uh, that it requires to protect its people and its borders. Next question comes from Lawrence Norman from Dow Jones. How long are we prepared to give Libya before moving to elections? Is it your understanding, as a European official said yesterday, that the TNC will respect existing oil contracts? Uh, they have said publicly uh, uh, that they will respect uh, oil contracts. I think that they've got a tremendous amount of work uh, ahead of them to review all the uh, the different contracts that have been let out over. You know, these are hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in term in all of the different sectors. Um, uh, how long are we willing to give them? Uh, uh, this is a question that the the Libyan leadership and the Libyan people are going to have to uh, decide for themselves. They have a the TNC has laid out a fairly a uh, specific timeline for the kind of uh, development of, uh, you know, a, democrat a path to a, a democratically elected government that they would like to see. But I think a lot of that is going to depend on the situation on the ground. They have to get settled in, uh, and uh, they've got a lot of work ahead of them. So I think that uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, necessarily uh, hold them to a specific uh, timeline, but certainly should support them in whatever they need uh, to, to make sure that they are able to achieve uh, what they would like in terms of a democratic vision of, a, of the future of a Libyan nation. The next question comes from Khaldun from Al Hayat newspaper in Palestine. You have been in, the, in middle diplomacy for years. What is the difference between Libyans, Syrians, Egyptians, Tunisians seeking freedom from dictatorships and Palestinians seeking freedom from military occupation that has been imposed on them for decades? Well, I think there was always the uh, there was the, a sense uh, among uh, observers over the of the past many years that somehow or other uh, that the, the the freedoms that were uh, enjoyed by the rest of the world somehow uh, just didn't apply to the people uh, in the Middle East. I think what we've seen over the past several months, uh, starting with the Tunisians and the Egyptians, and and then moving on to the Libyans. And uh, what we see in other uh, uh, countries of the Middle East is that Arabs are no different than anybody else in terms of the, uh, the freedoms that they want, uh, in terms of the human rights that they would like to enjoy, in terms of the civil society that they would like to see, and in terms of the future that they see for their, uh, their children and the generations to come. So there may be cultural differences among the, the different countries in the Arab world, but as far as uh, my experience has told me, and I think uh, others would observe, that the basic, uh, the rights that uh, certainly the Libyans have fought for and others have fought for over the past several months uh, are not distinguishable or not pe peculiar or, or particular to any one people, uh, whether they be Arab, uh, you know, Arab uh, or uh, Asian or South American or, or anybody else in the world. Next question comes from Sarah Carter from CBS News. She wants to offer her apologies for a few technical issues at the beginning and wants to know, what is your understanding of where Gaddafi is right now, and how involved is the U.S. in his exit strategy? Well, I, I think right now the, the question of where Gaddafi is is one that's being, uh, you know, pursued uh, by, the, uh, by the TNC. It's clear that um, uh, he needs to be uh, caught at some time because uh, I, my, our own view is that a, a Gaddafi uh, a free, uh, you know, in Libya is, is, could pose a, a continuing danger to the uh, to the success of the uh, uh, of the new government to uh, make sure that its writ is spread throughout the country. 
we uh, we will participate, uh, you know, to the extent that we are asked to. But uh, as of right now, uh, the it, it's a question for the uh, Libyan authorities uh, to find Gaddafi. Is the U.S. concerned about the reports that the TNC has been abusing and arresting sub-Saharan Africans and Libyans of African descent? And has the U.S. addressed this issue with the TNC's leadership? We, have, uh, we are extremely concerned by these reports. Uh, we have addressed this uh, issue uh, at the highest levels of the uh, TNC. Uh, they have assured us uh, that uh, they were, they're going to take these uh, allegations of, of mistreatment uh, of Africans uh, very seriously, and we have told them that we will uh, we will hold them to that commitment, and that in fact uh, we intend to follow up uh, not only uh, on a bilateral basis, but certainly in conjunction uh, with the United Nations and um, uh, its organizations. Uh, for example, the International Organization for Migration, uh, to ensure a speedy resolution uh, to the to the problem uh, posed by the um, uh, detention and general situation of African migrants in Libya. Uh, with, uh, in the context of the crisis of the last six months. We have about 10 minutes left, so I just want to remind you that if you have any questions, please feel free to start typing them in the lower left-hand portion of your screen now. Our next question comes from Khaldun from Al Hayat again. What about Palestinians seeking freedom from Israel occupation? Look, the question of, uh, you know, of, of, of people seeking um, Freedom. I mean, this is a. It's a question that we're we're dealing with. I, uh, like I've said in, in previous uh, speeches that uh, I've made throughout the country in these past several months, uh, there's no one cookie cutter uh, approach that we can apply to every situation. Uh, we certainly the the tool, the diplomatic, economic, political tools that the international community applied to Libya are not necessarily the same ones that we would apply to Syria or uh, issues uh, elsewhere in the Arab world. The United States has been intensively involved uh, for many, many years in trying to bring uh, Palestinians and Israelis uh, together. And in fact, uh, I believe our special envoy, David Hale, is in uh, Israel today, uh, continuing uh, to, to work the, the, the problem between the Israelis and Palestinians to try to bring them back to negotiations. Could you comment on the on the African Union's handling and position of the Libyan crisis? Uh, like I said before, we we have had uh, extensive dealings uh, with the uh, uh, AU during uh, the past several months. Uh, they they have had uh, I mean several African nations, in fact, uh, have already accorded uh, recognition uh, to the TNC. Uh, there have been differences, I think, among the African nations about how to. Uh, uh, how to deal with the question uh, of Libya. As you know, that the uh, Qaddafi had had uh, a lot of influence and a lot of relations in, uh, with African nations over the past uh, several years. So there were, uh, you know, there were some countries that uh, were kind of either sitting on the fence or continued to uh, support uh, Qaddafi. Uh, while the AU as, a, uh, as an organization uh, perhaps wasn't as uh, forthcoming in terms of its position uh, as the TNC uh, would have liked, I think uh, Individual African nations, for their part, uh, uh, were more forthcoming in terms of support uh, for the uh, TNC. I think that that said, uh, I think both uh, the the AU and African nations, as uh, as individual nations, and the TNC uh, recognize that uh, they need to develop a, a good relationship uh, in going forward. Because, as the TNC leadership said, they will not uh, they consider themselves a an African nation. And certainly the issues that uh, uh, and the consequences of what has happened over the past six months are going to affect uh, the uh, African nations, uh, whether they like it or not. And there's going to be a, a, a very important need for the two uh, to work together as time goes on. Our next question comes from Mina Al-Arabi. What is the total sum of Libyan funds still in U.S. control? And has the $1.5 billion been handed over now? My understanding uh, from the start is that we, uh, the amount of Libyan assets were approximately $30 billion, uh, quote unquote, controlled by the U.S., although that wasn't, uh, it wasn't necessarily all funding that we, we had complete control over. My understanding is that the $1.5 billion has begun uh, to be dispersed uh, to the TNC. I can't give the figure of, of how much uh, has gone to them already, but I, I know that the uh, the process is underway to get that uh, those needed funds to them. 
Next question comes from Jean-Jacques Cornish, Eyewitness News. How do you respond to President Jacob Zuma's criticism of NATO bombardment in, Lib in Libya? Uh, I know that there's been a difference of opinion between uh, some nations uh, in Africa and the, uh, and the campaign that uh, NATO undertook. But let's, look, let's go back to that period uh, between uh, mid-February and mid-March when, uh, you know, when the NATO coalition uh, began to coalesce uh, to take uh, action. At that particular point, don't forget that we had been asked by uh, the Arab League and by the GCC, very, very important uh, uh, precedent uh, for Arab nations actually to ask for an intervention uh, on the part uh, of, the, of the West. This was, this was not a crisis that we, uh, we invited. That this is not one that we, uh, you know, we, were, uh, we necessarily wanted to intervene in. But when the, when the humanitarian, uh, when the potential for humanitarian catastrophe became so evident uh, that uh, you know, when Gaddafi was on the uh, on the borders on, on the, uh, of Benghazi, uh, it became imperative uh, for us to act. So uh, I know that the criticism has been out there, but this is, like I said, this was a a, a response to a potential uh, humanitarian catastrophe, and uh, I think that the uh, the NATO uh, coalition, uh, including uh, some Arab nations, has been very careful in terms of the way it conducted its mandate to protect civilians. Uh, and, to, and to make sure that there was a no-fly zone. And I think they've been very, very discreet and very, very careful in terms of ensuring that there would be no uh, damage uh, to civilians uh, when undertaking military targets uh, in their campaign. Our next question comes from Arnout from LAM Palestine. Will G the Gaddafi family in Algeria be arrested? Uh, that's going to be a question uh, for the uh, Algerians, the new Libyan government. And um, how the you know how the interpretation of the UN sanctions applies uh, to that particular situation. Our next question comes from Lawrence Norman from Dow Jones, Belgium. What are your greatest concerns about what happens next? And is it possible we could see the conflict continuing for many months if Gaddafi is not caught? And is the prevalence of, prevalence of guns the biggest obstacle about stabilizing the situation in Libya? The two uh, things uh, that the TNC needs to do very quickly are to establish security, which they have basically done uh, throughout the country, and two, to make sure that the humanitarian needs of the Libyan people uh, are, uh, are, are, are satisfied. And I think they're making great strides in both of those areas right now. In order for them to begin to create a country, as I mentioned before, and to, uh, to, to uh, heal all the divisions that the Qaddafi regime created during its 42 years, they need an environment uh, of security and they need to be able to show that they are a credible governing authority. And I think that they are, are doing uh, that right now. So I think the biggest problem right now or the biggest challenge for them is to create that environment and create that political space that will allow them uh, to bring the Libyan people together as one and then to move forward uh, on to uh, you know, creating that uh, democratic process uh, that they've envisioned for so many months and which is the result of uh, the uh, tremendous courage uh, shown by the uh, Libyan people over the last uh, uh, several months. So they, they face a lot of challenges, but I think if they can uh, uh, make sure that the security situation is, is, uh, is established and make sure that all the, need, the humanitarian needs of the people are, are uh, taken care of, I think they've got a very good chance at, at moving ahead. And there will be challenges and there will be uh, problems that they face. I mean, that's only natural in a, after a conflict of this kind. Uh, but the international community stands ready to support them in whatever they need uh, during this very challenging time. Okay, we have time for one more question, and it comes from Brooks Tignier from Defense Weekly. NATO uniformly did not need a UN mandate for its involvement in Libya. It has no such mandate in Afghanistan, for example. The human rights abuses in Syria approach those of Libya. Why have U.S. and NATO not taken action against Syria as they have done in Libya? Uh, like I said before, uh, I think that as we're witnessing a, a, a tremendous cataclysm in the, in the Arab world, starting from Tunisia and Egypt, Libya, uh, and, uh, and Syria and, and other places. And uh, I think, as the Secretary and the President have, have said many times, uh, it's, it, it's a new concept that we're trying to apply. It's called smart power. And that is that for each situation, 
you take a look at the circumstances, and then you, uh, along with the international community, try to decide what are the best diplomatic, economic, political uh, tools uh, to use in that particular uh, situation. In Libya, as I said, uh, we, you know, we looked at the situation and we uh, determined that a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, tools were available to the international community and we used them and so far uh, it's been a very successful use of that. Each situation is not the same. I think in Syria you're seeing the international community as time goes on begin to uh, use each of the dif different uh, pressures and, diff and different uh, measures that are, that are uh, uh, available to it. But like I said, uh, each situation is different and uh, the international community has decided or uh, in, its, you know, in, the, in this practical use of smart power to take a look at each situation and then to, uh, to use the tools available as the, as the circumstances uh, require. Any parting thoughts on your behalf? No, I think that, um, look, uh, I think that w we, we should uh, salute the Libyan people for what they have done. I think that they are going to serve as a, as a model for historians for centuries to come in terms of what they've achieved. Uh, we know that they have a difficult road ahead of them. Uh, and a lot of the problems that they're going to face, this new leadership, is not of their own making. So let's give them the, the credit for what they have achieved and let's, uh, let's not uh, be so uh, pessimistic uh, about what the potential outcome will be here. There's going to be a, a, a period of time where uh, there's going to be a lot of challenges that they have to face. But, uh, you know, the Libyan people have showed themselves uh, to be uh, up to the challenge so far. And uh, I have every uh, faith that uh, the Libya uh, of several years from now is going to be a very different Libya than the we've seen over the past 42 years, and I think it's going to be a democratic Libya. And I think at the end of the day, all of those who've participated uh, in this effort to support the Libyan people are going to be very proud of uh, the fact uh, that what we have done to, to help them achieve this new nation uh, in the making. Thank you. Great. That's all the time we have for today. Uh, just a quick reminder, a full audio and video copy of today's program will be available uh, shortly after the conclusion of the program. Um, if you would like to continue this conversation, you can do so at, on our Twitter feed, at State Debt, or you can continue this conversation on our in-language Twitter feed, which is at USA Bill Arabi. I'd like to thank you, Ambassador Kretz, for joining us today, and I would like to thank all of you for joining us. Have a great day.